If you wanna go out this autumn and capture the vibrant colors, moody landscapes, the softer lighting, and even the active wildlife this season, then you need to work on properly capturing the entire landscape's ecosystem. And this is no exaggeration because there's so much happening outdoors this time of year that it's very easy to overlook the vast majority of what's going on around us. Being vigilant about everything I'm about to go over will tie in the entire story that you're about to capture this fall. So here's five autumn photography tips that will literally help you improve your ability to capture autumn this season and seasons going forward. So number one, photographing in bad weather. Let's break this down into two quick points. Low-lying clouds, fog and mist create atmosphere, mood, and depth in your image. They will also create a softbox effect, giving you beautiful diffused lighting, allowing you to shoot longer, giving you an extended period of time to be outdoors photographing, even as the sun gets higher in the sky. However, they can create desaturated or dull colors if it's too overcast or if it's too foggy. This photo is a great example of depth. The low-lying clouds in the Pennsylvania mountains created further separation between each tree, making the busy woodland landscape a little bit calmer. You see the main subject in the center, you have the main subject, which is this unique tree with a split trunk, surrounded by the single-trunked pit lolly pine trees. The mist also allows the trees behind the subject to fall off and be less distracting. So the first two trees standing straight kind of frame the main tree in the middle in the foggy sky on the right and the left, assist in framing and help guide the viewer's eyes throughout each detail of this woodland scene. Let's look at an example from Mood now. In this Moody example, we can see how the fog creates a cool temperature. The red leaves and the dead tree tell an almost eerie story. The fog in the foreground and the tree stump look as if they used to be attached and now they're disconnected. The backlighting of the rising sun an almost mythical or ethereal effect to the photo or emotion. When you see a photo like this or photos like these, what kind of mood does it put you in? The lighting in this photo simply amplifies the atmosphere. This was shortly after golden hour ended and the sun was starting to break through the mist, directing sunlight onto the path, cutting through the forest and the tree canopy. Utilizing this type of lighting in your compositions can create movement as well as a much more dynamic image. We'll go deeper into composition later on in the video, but really you can see how the trail or the tire tracks lead you from the left to the right as the sun directs you right onto that path up into the tree line and then throughout the rest of the photo and up into the tree canopy. You can also achieve much deeper contrast with fog and mist. Now this is a bracketed shot, so I took five photos and then I combined them in Lightroom. I've done very little post-processing to this image because the contrast between the whites highlights, midtones, and shadows, and the blacks was captured near perfectly. The whites, highlights, and midtones also create a contrast between the foreground and the background, simply meaning that these three trees as the main subject and then the forest floor stand apart from the background due to the diffused light in the fog, which is behind the subject, giving this almost fall off effect further isolating our main subject. One of the most important things as photographers that we do though is try and evoke emotion. So let's look at an example of how you can do that. Utilizing bad weather in your photos can help evoke emotion. When looking at an image like this, you can almost smell how crisp the air was. Feel the cool breeze on your skin, hear the crows and the ravens cawing, and the leaves falling, hitting the water, or falling on the ground. And again, as photographers, we have one frame to tell a story. So it's important to allow our viewers to experience our photos with more than just their eyes. You wanna try and get them to experience your photo utilizing as many senses as possible, bringing back childhood memories or why they love this season to begin with. Now that you know how to utilize low-lying clouds, fog, and mist, Let's move on to point number two. Where there's fog and low-lying clouds, you can usually expect mist and even the possibility of rain. So don't be afraid, again, of going out and utilizing this to get really unique photos. Unless you don't have weather-sealed gear or some protection for your gear, then maybe be a little bit extra cautious of the time you go out. But rain can further add depth, dimension, textures, in each of your photos. An example of rain adding dimension and texture, we can see right here by providing another element to the landscape. It deepens the story by providing extra information in the scene, allowing the viewer to further connect and understand the environment that you're shooting. Rain also challenges us as photographers 
to work with the more muted colors and artistic compositions. This can result in more poetic images of your environment and again just further captures the story of what environment you're shooting in. It also just looks cool. A rain can also produce new textures in your environment creating wet or damp surfaces. Take a look at this photo. The damp environment from the rain allowed this leaf to fall and stick to the surface of the rock. The surface of the rock is also darker from the moisture that it's absorbed and the water reflects these subtle highlights. As you look through the rest of the photo, you can see how the damp forest floor has deeper textures because of the recent rain. Like here in the foliage to the left of the rock, on the stick at the bottom of the rock, and the mushrooms that are hanging on the rock, and everything else around the edge of the photo. Moving away from bad weather and point two, now let's move on to number two, which is properly utilizing sunlight, which will brighten all the colors in the scene, as well as boosting the vibrancy of the colors that you're capturing. A few ways that you can do this is keeping an eye out for directional highlights, backlit subjects, and taking better advantage of the best golden hour times throughout the year. This photo is a perfect example of the sun boosting vibrancy caused by the sun directly hitting the trees on the right side of these trees. These reds and yellows are deeper and much more rich on the right side where the sun is directly hitting them. And on the left side, you notice how the colors are a lot more muted. This is because the yellow poplar tree is further in front of the red maples, blocking the low sun from reaching the trees on the left hand side and you get this boost of vibrancy, which can even be shown here in the reflection of the water where the right side of the tree is still highlighted and you even get some of those greens, which is again, a complementary color to the reds above. This photo is also my 2023 calendar. Pre-orders are live for a limited time and you can get all that information in the description below. But that's not all. As you're out hiking, meandering, scouting throughout these woodlands, keep an eye out for the backlit subjects. These backlit subjects can provide extra punchy colors as well as an opportunity for unique compositions. In the Smoky Mountains, I saw this river and I loved the way that the trees were being backlit, but the foreground seemed incredibly flat. So I set up my camera on my tripod, set my timer, and risked my well-being to walk across this dead rotted tree where I stood out as a silhouette emphasizing the sunlight cutting through the trees in the background. This allowed the photo to have a lot more layers to it where you can have the water flowing and the rocks a little bit more in the foreground, me and the log in the midground, and you still get the highlights from everything so it's not a total black silhouette, but the main focus are the beautiful, punchy, vibrant colors in the background. With the sun rising later in the morning and setting earlier in the evening, this means we no longer have to get up at 3.30 a.m. to get on site at about 5.30 or 6 a.m. We can now sleep in a little bit later as the sun starts rising around seven o'clock and we don't also have to be waiting out until eight, nine, ten o'clock in the evening whereas here in Maryland the sun starts setting around seven o'clock. So check your sunrise and sunset times. I prefer to use the app PhotoPills to track all the times which I go out and shoot. So next up is number three, incorporating the active wildlife this season. Lots of wildlife are active during this time of the year because they're preparing to hibernate or they're preparing to mate. Some of my favorite wildlife to photograph are black bear. They're so abundant out here in the Appalachian mountain range and are much more active as they prepare to fatten up and switch from eating mostly berries and eating walnuts and acorns. Elk are another one of my favorites as the rut begins, which is their mating period. Bull elks begin to bugle and fight one another for dominance of territory and mates. And they just make for absolutely stunning subjects within a fall setting. And again, that photo is in my calendar too. Another animal beginning the rut season is my favorite animal of all time, moose. This photo is actually from Harry Collins because I've never been able to photograph a moose, let alone have seen one. So check him out. He's a very talented wildlife photographer and filmmaker. I'll be in Colorado at the end of September going there specifically to photograph the moose rut, the aspens, and more than likely I'll throw some elk in there too. The last animals I'll mention are crows and ravens. For me growing up as a metalhead, these birds have always been a symbol of foggy, moody, spooky weather. The fall colors on their jetpack plumage make for an amazing contrast in the photos if you can capture one. Number four is paying attention to small details. Don't be afraid to get down and dirty on the forest floor and take photos of things like fungi that are really present this time of year, a single leaf, raindrops, and even turning your attention away from the changing trees to the changing colors of the brush like this fern. You can find incredible compositions and textures just among the forest floor. Looking at this photo, you have beautiful highlights, 
mid-tones, shadows, so many different changing colors with slight greens in there complementing the reds. You have yellows and oranges and then even a slightly bluish tealy green within the shadows, which I did add in post-processing, but it looks good. Going back to mushrooms, this mushroom really stood out to me because the sun broke through the tree canopy and illuminated this small little detail on the forest floor. If we look closer, there's even more detail. Hanging off of the mushroom on the right hand side is a little cobweb that is attached to the tree that it is growing out of. And it's those little details that I love so much. I believe this is an angel cat mushroom. I've tried looking it up, but so many mushrooms look alike and I'm no expert. So if you know, let me know in the comments below because I'd like to actually know. Here's another set of mushrooms and I wanted to show you this one because I thought it was a great example of textures. The damp ground makes the detail of the mushroom caps really stand out as well as enhancing all the details on the roots, the dirt, and the leaves. Now this isn't my favorite photo because I wish I would have composed it a little bit more to the left because I feel like the mushrooms compete with this root and the highlights on the root a little too much and I would have rather had them competing with the black here but if I remember correctly you just couldn't get all the little mushrooms that were present. And like before, if you know what mushroom this is, uh, let me know that too, because the only thing I found was that they might be psychedelics, which would have been interesting. Just kidding, I can't do that, I'm in the military. Lastly, keep an eye out for spider webs. In the morning, they'll often carry plenty of dew on them, which make for a moody and aesthetically pleasing photo. Plus, when it comes to shooting spider webs, and I know most people hate spiders, but it's so amazing that something so tiny can create something so beautifully and well-constructed. And I just think they're incredibly cool. Number five, the last one, and the most important one, spend more time on your compositions. As photographers shooting this time of year, we can get so easily lost in the vibrancy and bright colors of the landscapes around us. Really, sometimes it feels like there's just so much to take in, but slow down and observe everything around you. Looking for compositions that are unique and stand out looking for things like color composition, complementary colors, and even maximizing the use of your foreground, midground, and backgrounds. So again, let's quickly break down these three points. Color composition is another way to evoke emotion and influence how your viewers respond to your photos. Utilize hue, which is the designation of color, saturation, the vividness or richness of the color, luminance, how light or dark a color is, and color temp, how warm or cool your overall image is to affect the way autumn colors relate to each other in your photos. Try and compose your photos around color. In autumn, so many of these colors are competing with one another and a great composition can really bring them together and make for a visually pleasing photo. So here are a few examples of what I like to look for. Darker colors which advance in a photo, light objects that recede in a photo, warm colors advancing in the photo, cool colors, that recede throughout the photo. Warm colors are exciting or welcoming. Then you have blues and greens, which generally bring forth a calming feel to them. Now let's talk about complementary colors. Complementary colors are colors that are opposing from one another on a color wheel, and they generally complement each other. And we know this or we see this a lot within nature. If we look at this photo, we obviously see oranges and blues. If we extract these colors, we can find that these colors are complementary to one another. Looking at the color wheel here, we see orange and yellowish, deep orange, and even some dark reds. And right across from that, we have blue. And this is why the orange and teal combo is so popular. Even in my backdrop here, you can see I have a little bit of orange and I have a little bit of blue and teal. Another popular color combo is reds and greens. In this photo, we have red and green in the foreground and an orangish reddish complementing the bluish fog in the background. And I really like this for this photo because it almost creates two different dynamics within the image and you can even see that on the color wheel where you have the reds across from the greens and then the blues sort of in the middle so while you're composing your shots for colors and keeping an eye out for complementary colors don't forget to try and utilize the foreground and maximize well your foreground mid-ground and background looking at this wildscape photo here I wanted to capture this entire scene. Breaking it down, I wanted the bluish Quaker Lady flowers in the foreground because they complemented the orange in the field and the trees. Then you had the subtle reds 
in this tree here and the reddish orangish coat of the elk with the green foliage in the foreground and in the background. You can easily see in this photo, foreground, midground, and background. And all these elements guide you through the photo. But you know what we missed in this video? What we need to capture the best autumn photos. So go watch this video next to solve that problem.